Kyle Rojas.
Hi, welcome everyone. Hi, um, can can everybody hear me? Yes, you're clear. Okay. So hi, uh, we are from Michigan State University, and uh, in this tutorial, we are going to talk about uh, some some stories about adversarial attacks and defenses. So we have already put our tutorials link on, on the chat box at here. Uh, so you can refer to this website for our tutorials, abstract and uh, schedules, the recorded video and uh, our slides. So in, the, in, the, in this tutorial, the, we will introduce so for the first half in, the, in this tutorial, we'll introduce about some attacking algorithms and uh, two types of defending algorithms, which are the gradient masking and the uh, adversarial training. After our, after our coffee break, coffee break on uh, 11, uh, on 11 o'clock, we are going to talk about some some stories about certified defenses and uh, adversarial learning studies in the graph domain. So in this in this tutorial, we are going to play our recorded video, but you can just feel free to stop us whenever you have any question. Okay, now now we can get started. Hi, welcome everyone. We are from Michigan State University, the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. In this tutorial, we are going to talk about some stories about adversarial attacks and defenses. In this tutorial, we are not only covering the basic algorithms to do attacks and defenses, but we will also discuss some very advanced technologies in this area. So by giving this tutorial, we can hopefully help our audience to have a basic idea about what is the safety issue in machine learning and how we can carefully evaluate this safety for our models and how we can finally build very safe model in our applications. At the beginning of this tutorial, I will have a brief introduction about what is this phenomena of adversarial attacks or adversarial examples. So as all of us know, machine learning models have made so many great accomplishments in recent years. For example, for an image classification task on the ImageNet dataset, from the year of 2014, 
the best machine learning models have already outperformance than humans. So because the machine learning models are so successful, people even start to use them in many safety critical tasks. For example, uh, in, the, in the University of Michigan, they start to use this autonomous driving vehicles as shuttle, shuttling buses in their campus. And uh, another example is that since we frequently uh, usually use our mobile phone to pay for stops, and uh, these applications may just recognize our face and uh, do the authentication. authentication. So in both these two cases, we want our machine learning models can be very safe. We do not want anyone that can easily cheat them, right? However, is our machine learning model really safe for real world applications? And, uh, the, and the answer is actually no. So here is an example that shows that our machine learning models are not always as safe as we thought. So first, imagine that if we have a very good classification model on the image net itself. Okay, now, if we are given such an image, like this cat image, so at first, the model will give a correct prediction for the image. However, in recent years, these papers just show that using their algorithms, they can find or calculate such a noise that once added on the original one, the model will give totally wrong prediction for the synthesized image. So and here the model will give a strawberry class for it. Because this noise is carefully calculated, so we call this synthesized image an adversarial example. And the more dangerous thing is that instead of the adversarial examples can only happen in the digital environment, actually they can also appear in the real world physical environment. Here is an example that someone tries to fool a traffic sign detector of an autonomous driving car. So in order to achieve this goal, they just find some places on the stop sign and they attach some white patches on the stop sign. But by doing this, they can successfully make the autonomous driving car cannot recognize this stop sign. And please note that the location of these white patches are also carefully calculated. So this is to say, the existence of adversary examples can truly bring safety concerns to our machine learning model applications. Actually, we would like to say the safety concerns for the robustness issue can happen at everywhere in the machine learning applications. So the first thing is that instead of the computer vision tasks we just talked about, the adversarial attacks can also happen in other data domains. For example, the graph data. In this tutorial in KDD, if someone are interested in the graph structure data, we would like to say the adversarial attacks in the graph data can have different behavior with the attacks in the image domain. For example, because the nodes or the samples in the graph structure data are not independent anymore. So in this case, if one attacker attacked one node in the graph, maybe it can also bring adversarial effect to the other nodes in this graph. And so in this case, maybe the attacker can even bring malicious influence to the overall performance of the model. And the similar story can also happen 
in the natural language processing tasks. If you are interested, you can refer these papers, which are doing a text on the text domain or the audio domain. And the another thing is that the adversarial text we just talked about are most from the testing time of the model. However, it can also happen during the training time. It is because that sometimes we want our trained model have a very good performance. We usually go to collect many data from outside resources. For example, some, some mobile phone applications just collect their users' data. So in this process, maybe there exist some adversarial attackers who insert some fake training samples into our training pool. And we don't know that. By this process, they will control the trained model to have some malicious behavior. We call this process the data poisoning or adversarial attacks during training. And one example here is that a team from Stanford showed that by inserting one faked image into the training set, they are able to let the trained model wrongly predict a small set of targeted test samples. So all these cases and examples can show that we should pay a lot of efforts on studying the safety issues of machine learning models. But how we can carefully evaluate our model's safety and how we can finally build safe models we would like to say both these two questions cannot be easily answered. So this story can briefly help us to explain why I say solving the two problems are not always as easy as we saw. So when the adversarial attacking algorithms just came out in 2014 and 15, after that, there are several very heuristic defending algorithms which propose they successful they are successfully managed to protect our models against adversarial attacks some of the methods such as this greedy masking method just tries to confuse the attacker to find useful information to do attack however after that there are some works that they try to design new attacking algorithms to break those defenses. So this story tells us that under different attacking algorithms and or under different safety evaluation methods, our defending methods can have a different level of safety property. So in order to be more formally or more carefully to check the robustness of our model. There are future strategies such as adversarial training that were certified defenses which managed to achieve this goal. So in our tutorial, we both talk about adversarial attacks and the defenses as a relationship as a like an arm race between each other. So the defenses algorithms tries to propose different strategies which tries to improve the model safety or robustness. And uh, we also talk about the adversarial attacking algorithm, which give us tools that we can formally check the, or formally evaluate the model safety. So finally, if we can understand this process, it can help us to finally build very safe models. So here is the outline of our tutorial. At first, we introduce some basic and traditional attacking algorithms. And the next, we will introduce the defense algorithms and their corresponding adaptive attacks, which try to break those defenses. And in the third part, we will also introduce some related works in the adversarial learning in the graph domain. So, so finally, we will introduce to our audience a very easy to use platform to do the adversarial learning studies on Python.
So at first, please welcome Yaxin to have an introduction about the attacking algorithms. Hello, everyone. I'm Yaxin Li from Michigan State University. I'm going to introduce the attack section. First, we begin with two classic attacking algorithms, FGSM and PGD. In these two cases, we assume that the attacker is able to know everything about the model, including the model architecture and the parameters. The attacker's goal is to find a pre-division delta to be added on the testing sample, and the new sample we get would be classified as a round label. And also, we want this delta to be small, so that the adversarial image will look similar to the original image. Then we consider how to formulate this question. Actually, we want to find a delta that satisfies this formulation. Recall that when we train a clean model, we minimize the loss function for training data over its parameter theta. Thus, the model is highly likely to give the correct output. Now, for our task, after we train a clean model, we want to find a test sample that could mislead the model. So, similarly, we maximize the loss function in a small range around x, and we believe that this point is very likely to be wrongly predicted. So, we formulate this attacking problem as this maximization problem. In order to solve this problem, here is one algorithm called FGSM that tries to give you the maximum point. Here, the delta is calculated proportional to the gradient of loss at the point x. And this epsilon is the pre-division budget. This one-step gradient ascent method can approximate solution for the objective function. To note that this one-step gradient-based method is already a powerful attack, which has highly atta high attacking successful rate on benign DNN models. And PGD algorithm. This is a multi-step iteration version of HGSM algorithm, which could be more precise. Each time it moves a small step and using an iterative miner to do multi-step optimization. Once the point go beyond the pre-division constraint, then it needs to be projected back and continuous to optimize. Through this process, it can find a better maximization point compared to FGSM. Thus, the adversarial examples created should be much stronger than FGSM. From these two algorithms, we can see that we are actually finding a local maximum loss for all the points which is on the neighbor of the original data point. We can imagine that the bigger the loss, the more likely the attack could success. So we define this local maximum as adversarial risk of model F on the data point X. By calculating the average risk over the whole distribution, we can evaluate the overall robustness of this model. Also, this measurement of robustness can inspire us to design defending algorithms. For example, we directly op optimize this term in order to improve model robustness. And we will cover more details in the next section, which is about adversarial defense. Another representative tentative algorithm is CW. These attack methods look into the problems from a different perspective. Instead of finding the data point that is most likely to be wrongly classified in a fixed area, the model, the method is trying to find a preservation which can successfully attack the model, but can be as small as possible. Compared to the former attacks, a adversarial example could be more sneaky and hard to detect with selected attacking parameters. So look at the formulation. 
Finding the smallest delta, such as a model output, is not the true label Y. In order to make this optimization problem solvable and optimizable, they first introduce this margin loss. Here, the function day is a score function for the model. And most of the time, V is the score before the softmax operation, as everybody may know. It means to calculate the difference between the score for the truth label and the maximum score of any other label. When this function is below zero, it means that the correct label got the maximum score. Because the model gives the largest score to the true label, then the prediction is correct. Otherwise, the prediction is wrong. So our problem can be written in this form. Minimize the delta subject, subject to the margin loss is greater than zero. Then we can use log alarm multiplier to solve this problem to add this constraint into the objective and approximately solve this problem. When the CW attack first proposed, it breaks several defense which were shown to be effective to the existing attacks at that time. From this algorithm, we get clues for another way to define robustness measurement. We evaluate the minimum perturbation. The average minimum perturbation could reflect the robustness of the model. As a short summary, we introduce two types of attacking algorithms. In these two attacks, shed light on how to measure the robustness or safety of a machine learning model. Before we move on to the black box attack, we first introduce an interesting property of adversarial attack, which is called transferability. The above attack method assumes that the working model is given and the attack is specified to the working model. However, it is not always true. For example, here are two CN models, which are trained for the same classification tasks but they have different structures. The fact is that if you generate a diverse example specified for model A, it is also very likely that it can attack model B. So this property makes black box attack possible. Under black box attack setting, we assume that the model is unknown. The setting is more realistic. For example, attacker can attack some online models Attacker achieves this by finding a substitute model and generate a worse examples that are highly likely to attack the target ones. There are some works which show that their black box attack can successfully attack public machine learning platforms such as Clarify, which is an image classification model in Google Cloud or Amazon. There are also other score-based approaches to launch black box attacks, for example, this one which stands for zero order optimization. The underlying strategy is quite clear. It assumes that the attacker has access to prediction confidence score from the weakened classifier's output. In this case, we can approximate the derivative information around the weakened simple x using the score function for those simple around x. Then attacker could utilize the approximate gradient to calculate the adversarial example. Another strong black box attack is an attack. Instead of finding one adversarial example, this attack tries to find a distribution around a benign sample such that the adversarial loss is small. Then a sample draw from this distribution is likely to be adversarial. The attacker gets this distribution by updating the mean value using gradient-based optimization. First, draw samples from this distribution, and then update the mean value of the distribution using the gradient of loss. By doing so, we can get a probability density functions of adversarial examples. Later, more and more black box attack appears. Since black box attack methods are mostly relying on continuous querying the weighting model, 
where in realistic, too much querying could be easily distinguished and be willed as abnormal behavior that's failed to get successful and worse examples. So the attacking efficiency should be taken into consideration when designing black box attacks. Here are several black box attack algorithms and their querying efficiency. Improving the efficiency of black box attack can be an important task to launch the attack in real world DNN systems. As we can see, all the above attack happens in testing time. <clears throat> Now we are going to introduce one attack happens in training time, which is poisoning attack. This is one targeted clean label poisoning attack, which aims to control the behavior of a classifier on one certain test class. Through so adding poisoning sample without changing their labels into the training set. Look at these two classes of image the first line, fish, which are the samples from the target class. And the second line, dogs, which are the base class image. Then what we're going to do is computing the poison example P by computing this formulation. Here, assume that we have a clean network and Fx is a feature space representation of the input X it denotes the function that propagate an input X through the net through this train network to the layer before it stops max. So this first term, fx minus ft, is to calculate the feature space distance from point in sample X and sample T from target class. And the second term is to calculate the input space distance from poisoning sample X to base class sample B. So by minimizing these two terms, the sample we get should be close with target class sample in the feature space will look similar to the base class sample. Then retraining the model with both poisoning sample we calculated and clean samples that will result in the change of decision boundary and may include those poisoning sample as target class. So those fish would be, would be predicted as stock for this poisoning model. So the fish from the target class would be classified as stock by this poisoning network. This attack is hard to notice and could reach high successful rate with a small amount of poisoning samples. Another one, backdoor attack, which is also a poisoning attack. This one is easy to implement, hard to notice, and dangerous in realistic. Just add some backdoor keys to some of the training samples and assign a target label. Thus, the testing sample with the same backdoor key would be classified as the same target label. Only a small amount of those samples could lead to 100% successful rate. Look at this picture, those people who wear the same glasses can be recognized as a target person, which would cause dangerous effect when launching deep learning systems, especially face recognition systems into real world setting. And here is the end of attack section, and next we are going to introduce this defense section. So I just have a, I just have a pause on here. Uh, is, is there anyone that has any questions about how to do adverse arrow attacks? Yeah, I had a, a brief question, um, which is, excuse me, I had to join late, but um, are you able to, discuss at all adversarial attacks or adversarial um, defenses in discrete spaces mm -hmm. um, particularly like if your if your data is uh, binary rather than continuous where a lot of gradient based methods presumably wouldn't work for more discrete data 
So, so maybe and here we only we only consider about continuous data. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Okay. Actually, the basic idea of doing attack is quite is it's not very complicated. So we just do doing as the opposite way as we do the training. In the training, we want to minimize the loss. So we want the model to have right correction, uh, correct prediction. So now if the model is fixed, so we just want the model to have a max, have, have a large loss value. So we want the model to have a wrong prediction. So that is the basic idea how that how they can do this adversarial attacks. Hi, I also have yeah. a question. Yeah. So most of the examples that we see, they mm -hmm. uh, are with examples of images and deep learning models. Mm -hmm. Are these uh, transferable easily to say tabular data and say tree ensembles, like black box would be because it's independent of the model, but mm -hmm. does it depend on the type of input data? So you mean, is, uh, so you mean it's dependent on the type of the data? Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you mean? So uh, in case of image, we see for this example, noise mm -hmm. is added in image space, right? So yes. will these be easily extendable to say tabular data, say titanium data set or any tabular data instead of images? Yeah, sure. We will also talk about the text, uh, the text data. For example, okay. you just change one letter in a paragraph. Hmm. And the machine just get a wrong guess about the topics of this paragraph. You see here, hmm. change, change this uh, a D to the capital P, and uh, the model just give a wrong prediction for the topic. Well, right, right. So though they are extendable, right? Then yeah. Yes, and the, in this tutorial we are also have a, a detailed introduction about the attacks on the graph domain. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Yes. So actually in this topic, most of the studies, the most of the general studies are con concentrated, concentrated on the graph, uh, on the image domain. Because maybe the image models are more simple than the models for other data domains. And they just use the image domain for detail uh, for more theoretical study or more general studies. So I have a question about the uh, the, the talk. So mm -hmm. I wonder. Uh, so now until now I understand that you just change the data. Yeah. For testing purpose, you change the test case. For yeah. the training purpose, you change the training data. So sure. since you change the data. You kind of poison data, so then you can uh, well, uh, make the model make a wrong this uh, prediction, right? Yes, yes. So there's one kind of adversary attack, right? Yes. Do you have other kind of adversary attacks? You mean the adversary attack from training phase? Yeah. So this. All this are based on the data. You change the data, right? You yeah, change the training yeah. data, then it's a, the training data is poison. So then, since the training data have, is poison, so then you train your model. You cannot couldn't train a good model, right? Yeah, we cannot. Yeah, the other way is you change the testing. Case. You change the so test test data, right? So yeah. then the model is built from the original data. Mm -hmm. So they didn't see the kind of things. So you change, uh, you, you, then, they, you know, when the test the case is, you know, the data is poisoned or changed uh, or at noise, then the model cannot make correct prediction. So yeah. both training and testing mm -hmm. just change the data because the, you know, the data is po poison, right? That's yeah. the one, mm -hmm. one way of, of attack, right? One way of attack is change the data. Right. So attackers try to change the data. Yes. Right. That's my understanding. Yes. Do you have 
to consider other way attacker could use other way to attack uh, attack the model. So you mean oh. they can change the model itself? Then do you have a power of yeah? That's another way how they can do that. Or do what would you talk about that later? Actually, I didn't see too much, too many works about changing the model, because it seems like maybe we don't have to. Actually, when we are doing the data poisoning, actually we are doing changing the model, right? We yeah, that's, that's because the data, right? Change the data, you change the model, right? Yeah. sequence, right? Yes. So maybe directly changing the model is not quite possible for the real applications. So and do you have some uh, concern? You see, we have the model, but uh, the model is, you know, is kind of secret. We don't want, uh, you know, it's not become public, it's private. Mm -hmm. So whether we can, you know, do some attack, attackers do some attack, can figure out your model. After we figure out uh -huh. the model become a uh, transparent to me so I can do anything I want because your model is I know your model already actually I know some works that are trying to trying to uh, get information from the gradients uh, get information of other people's data by the gradients uh, so, so, I mean, hmm. actually, what is the benefit that if an attacker wants the information of the, about the, the about if, the model itself? Yeah, if an attacker know the model, I can, you know, I can cheat to the model, right? Sure, I think. Then I can achieve my goal easily if I'm not attacker. Actually, even you don't have the model, you, you don't have access to the victim model you want to attack, but you can still use the black box attacks to attack those models. And your question, uh, maybe I'd hear your question, your question is that we just uh, get all the information about this model itself. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, I had a question actually. So for black box, I guess, uh, attacks, mm -hmm. um, what, what I guess, uh, how does one uh, find a distribution for models that are more like one shot learning based, like uh, face recognition? So um, you can't really insert poison data, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, like you only get like maybe one, I guess, image per person per se, or, or a few images per person. So how is it that one could, I guess, have an adversarial attack in that sense that it doesn't uh, recognize the person in question or something like that? So you mean... Mm, like so you had an image of uh, the distribution finding like uh, data points within the normal distribution, like within the benign um, examples or benign data? uh don't know what slide that was on it was a bit further up i'm not sure so you mean uh, during the attack we insert no Can so so during the attack how does or sir in order to perform the attack rather how does one find the you know distribution of benign uh values in order to find an adversarial or produce an adversarial uh attack when for for models that are uh, one shot learning based essentially, such as image recognition. Actually, when we are doing black box attack, we do the model is fixed. Right. You can actually even the one shot learning you can insert many doing many queries. It's fine. The one shot means that we only have one training sample. It doesn't matter how many tests or queries you you do on the model. The model is fixed right here. Right. You can just send your uh, perturbations for many times and you guess what is the most possible way to do the attack and it's fine. 
is that how one finds the distribution of benign values or is that not? Sorry. Benign? There was a normal distribution listed in one of the slides where it had a range of oh, yeah, benign you values. That. Yes, you, you talk about the net attack one. Uh, I believe it was uh, earlier in, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I, 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 will allow, I will have my team, teammate to share the slides. Okay. It's on, it's on no her. problem. Yeah. Uh, can you see the slides? Um, Just one second. Yes, that one. That was the slide right there. Yes, uh, yeah. you're asking about this. Yeah, my, my question was how does someone find this distribution? Um, is it just they keep on sending in uh, inputs oh. until they produce something like this, you know? Oh yes, uh, the, the the process is um, you in, initialized from one point around the original data point, and this is the initialization of this uh, of the mean value of this normal distribution, and then sure. you in sam you sample you samples uh, you draw some samples from this distribution, and you um, yeah you keep querying the model and you get the get the loss. And then you do gradient-based uh, optimization to uh, to update this mean value. Finally, you got this. Uh, you got a normal distribution that the sample you draw from this distribution is likely to be adversarial. Uh, it does. This, is this process make sense to you? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, most of the black box attack is based on keep querying the uh, attacking uh, the victim model. So, a lot of work has been uh, studying how to improve the efficiency. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so in my understanding, so in my understanding, it's just the black box. Just, uh, for example, first uh, throw many guests and. Uh, put them into the model and uh, get some feedback from the score of the prediction of the model. And then right. it take another many, many times of the guesses. And uh, by this by this process, it can iteratively find the most possible the zero attack. Thank you. So, 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 so I actually have a question based on this. So the normal distribution here, we keep querying the model, then we get the distribution. So the distribution is, the, about the training data or about the, the test. Uh, testing test data. Test data. Test data. Okay. We can assume the model is fixed. We don't care about the training anymore. Yes, and we, we don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, we can move on to next question. If no one has questions, we can. Okay, just let me sh share my screen, please. Okay. In this section, I'm going to introduce some defenses algorithms which try to protect our models to resist adversarial attacks. And I will also introduce some adaptive attacks which try to break those defenses methods. So typically, if we want to protect our model against adversarial attacks, Maybe there are two main ways that we want to try. The first way is that whether we just build a very simple classification model. For example, in the image classification task, no matter how you calculate 
this adversarial perturbation, you can never find an adversarial example which can successfully mis mislead our model. And as a, an alternative way, maybe we can also try to build such a de detector which can distinguish between adversarial examples and the collision examples. So by building this detector, the model can re reject to make prediction for those images which are highly likely to be adversarial. Actually, you can try either way of these two and uh, make your model be safer. However, either two goals are not very easy to be achieved. So at first, I will introduce one type of relatively heuristic methods to do the defenses. They are called gradient masking or gradient obfuscation. Basically, these methods are trying to set barriers or make difficulties for the attackers when they are doing attacking. So first, please remember that our introduced attacking algorithms, for example, this FGSM algorithm, most of them are based on calculating the gradient information of the model on the input sample X. So as a defender, maybe we can consider that whether we are able to hide or mask this gradient information. So by this way, the attacker can be confused and he cannot find a useful information from the gradient and then he cannot do the attack anymore. Based on this motivation, there are some methods trying to do this gradient masking strategies. For example, they can make the model always have zero gradients. They can also make the model have very fuzzy or very misleading gradients information. Or even they can try to make the machine learning model become discrete so there does not exist gradients anymore. So please follow me to see a real example which shows how they can do this gradient masking in practice. This work is from 2018, which called input transformation defense. The defense idea is not very complicated. During the model testing time, in addition, you know, in addition to the ori original testing framework, they just add one additional component to the model called the transformation operation G. And usually this operation G is not continuous or differentiable. For example, they use this bit depth reduction operation. This means that Usually our RGB image have eight bit depths, which means that which means that each pixel have 256 values to pick. However, their operation G just to reduce these depths, bit depths from eight to three. You can you can see this process as a image denoising process. So the defending idea is also from here. Doing that for calculated adversarial perturbation are very sophisticated. So if I do this denoising process, maybe I can exclude your adversarial effect and your adversarial attacking can be failed. And we can see from some experimental results that once we add this input transformation term, into the original model, the model can have higher accuracy against the adversarial examples which were originally generated to attack this model F. And if we take a closer look at the operation function G, actually because the G function is not continuous or differentiable, an attacker even cannot calculate the gradient information. So he cannot directly apply the vanilla attacking algorithms. 
In the field of advanced cellular learning, they call this gradient masking phenomenon or gradient masking strategy the shattered gradients means that you intentionally break the gradient information. And from the experimental results of this work, it really shows that it has higher accuracy for the adversarial examples, which was originally generated to attacking this model as. So we can consider that does this experimental results does show or prove that the input transformation difference can help our model to be safer. And the answer is again, no. The meter works and here just to show that they will design new attacks which can break the differences such as this input transformation difference. So in this tutorial, I will take this input transformation difference as an example to show our guys a very important and useful adaptive attacking method which, which can break this shattered gradients strategies. This attack is called BPDA attack. So imagine that if we are an attacker, we want to use backpropagation to calculate the gradients of the F on the input X. But now, because of the G is different, is non-differentiable, we cannot calculate it exactly. So is there any alternative methods that can help us to approximate these gradients? So at, so at this stage, as an attacker, we want to do the back propagation from this loss value to the input sample X, right? And if we have a, if we take a closer look at this formulation of the gradients by the chain rule, so now what is available for us is the back propagation from the loss to the output of the G operation. And what is not available for us is just this differentiation from G to X. So here is where the idea of a BPDA attack kicks in. So please remember that the reason that adding such a G operation term does not does too much harm to the model's overall accuracy. It means that this G function must preserve most of the information of the original image X. So it means that this G function may be close to an identity function. So the BPDA attack just act as this way. It use a substitute function called H, H function, which is an identity function to replace its G function when doing the back propagation. So by calculating the gradient test this way, they have an approximated attack in our gradients. And the experimental results just show that this approximated gradient can offer us much, much useful information for the attacker to, to the attacking. And that they can also have high possibility to find adversary examples. So by this way, the BPDA attack can successfully attack the defenses from the input transformation defense. Actually, there are more defenses methods which are similar to this input transformation or also based on the shattered gradients. You can always try to try to use this BPDA attack to test their safety. After the introductions about the shatter, shatter gradients and the BPDA attack, I want to also introduce an, another main case of gradient masking and its breaking strategies. This type of gradient masking strategies is trying to insert randomness into the model. So at this time, the added transformation operation T is randomized. 
it act as this way. So at first, it randomly choose some places in the image and then do the cropping. After cropping several pieces, it then resizing them back to the original size and send all of them to the function, to the neural network. After that, it will have a max voting to find the final prediction outcome. So they assume that by inserting this randomness, they may have a chance to eliminate the effect from adversarial perturbation. And also, you can also imagine that even you do the adversarial perturbation on the original image, however, you don't know which image adhere finally that I will use for the final prediction. So maybe there is still chance that your adversarial perturbation can fail. So in the field of adversarial learning, they call this gradient masking strategy the stochastic gradients. So does this so does this approach really help our model to be safer again? Maybe we can consider us this way. As an attacker, even I cannot control the final randomness of this model. But can I make this model have a higher expected loss value? Or it means, can we as the model have much probability to have a wrong prediction. Again, if we formulate this problem in math this way, the difficulty is that we do not have existing approaches to calculating the expected loss value of the model output to the input image x. However, we can also dispatch correct bounding strategies which can break this stochastic stochastic gradient defenses. These attacks are called EOT attack. The idea is just that, for example, if I am the attacker, I can sample this randomness by myself. I can simulate this random process on scratch by myself. For example, I also do this cropping for many times. And then, uh, I can do the back propagation to calculate the gradients for each sample from the randomness. After that, I can somehow have an expected version of the gradients by myself. This expected version or the approximated version can also give us many much information about the real gradients. And uh, if we just use this gradient to do attack, we also have a very high chance to successful in attacking. So the story from the gradient masking and their corresponding adaptive attacks teaches us that in order to finally build a very safe model, we sometimes have to do the self-checking by doing adaptive attacks. And please remember that since the black box attacks also does not need the gradient information, so it is also a good idea that we just use this black box attack technologies to check our, whether our model have this phenomena of gradient masking or check whether our model can really help to improve the model robustness. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. At the beginning, you mentioned there are two basic ways to defend the, the, uh, the attack. And one is uh, we have classifier. The other is we have a detector. Uh, mm -hmm. 
in my understanding, these two methods are quite similar. So is there any difference between them? Actually, you actually different people suggest uh, different strategies which will try to achieve one of them. But actually, I also agree with you that um, maybe there's not too much difference actually. Yeah, because their their objective, I think, may be the same to detect the uh, adversary samples. But actually, people really use very different strategies in order to achieve either one of it of them. Oh, okay. Yes. And then I'll check out more papers there. Yes. So one thing I want to mention is that for this for this defenses methods that we are talking about today are only concentrated on defense attacks during the test time. So we don't talk about the defenses against those poisoning attacks which you you change the training data. We just talk about the attack defenses against the attacks during test time. Test time, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. My understanding about the uh, the uh, detection and the classification, mm -hmm. if the classification is a binary, then kind of similar. If the classification is a multi class, then detection is a different from the classification. Actually, that. Mm, actually, most of them are uh, binary. But I think I can tell one main difference, main, main difference between the first goal and the second goal. Actually, when you are doing the detection, you don't have to build DNA models. You can do some statistical tests to tell whether an example is more likely to be a adversarial or not. And uh, for if you want to do the first goal, you want to build a very safe classifier, you have to use DNA models. So maybe the second way can give us more flexibility when we are trying to build this detector. You can use Thanks. some statistical tools. Um, I had a question uh, mm -hmm. at the end of this session, uh, at the end of the slide, right? You said about something about uh, black box, uh, so strong black box attack. So what was the point there that since they don't use gradients, it's uh, they are difficult to break? Yeah, even so they are difficult to achieve, uh, to, to, applic uh, to apply, but you see that the gradient masking methods mm -hmm. just try to try to make difficulties for attacker because they assume that the attacker want to use the gradient information to do attack. You, you remember that when we are generated or certain examples, we calculate these gradients. And the gradient, okay. this kind of defense just assume that, and okay, now you, you, you calculate gradients. So now what if I just mask or, or destroy, destroy these gradients, you cannot calculate your gradients anymore. So by this way, you cannot attack my model. But somehow this assumption is not true because in black box attack, you don't even need to use the gradient information. Mm -hmm. You just guess some possible perturbations and you try. You don't have to use this gradient information. So if the black box attack can successfully attack your model, so, so there is no chance that even you cannot use our traditional way to attack a model, but you can also use black box attack to attack our, the model. So by this way, you you can still you still cannot say your model is safe. Right. So, so as I in my understanding, this kind of gradient masking or gradient obfuscation defenses. Are based on and based on the assumption that the adversarial examples are very weak. You just pay a lot of efforts on calculating the green, uh, calculating the adversarial example. And once I do some modification or add some noise on your calculated 
calculated example, your effect, your adversary effect does not exist anymore. So that's the assumption of their their differences. But so we show that for if, but we should uh, we show at here that actually the attack can be very strong. That if we just based on their defenses, we do the attack. We can also attack this heuristic defenses method. I had one uh, question, which is like not directly related. So uh, we have adversarial examples, right? Which are uh, of a different class by adding just little bit of noise, right? Mm -hmm. But there is also this uh, thing called counterfactual example, where a counterfactual of a point is a point that will give a different class, the same thing. So I'm just trying to understand, like philosophically, does it make sense to use these adversarial attack methods to get counterfactual examples? Like I'll do an adversarial attack and the point that produces that attack, so say if this uh, cat and with the noise uh, and that I'll call a counterfactual example. I mean, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, what's, what's the big difference between both of them, given that they both change the class? So, so your question is that whether we, so during the test time we should insert the, so whether we can attack the model at here, and you mean? Uh, no, so what I'm saying is, um, so we have these kind of counterfactual explanations, right? So suppose I, yes. uh, suppose uh, textual data, suppose I have some tabular data, mm -hmm. and then I say that if, if suppose my income had been 10,000 rupees more, I would have got the loan approved. So this is a counterfactual example. So uh, what I'm saying is that can we use these adversarial attack techniques to find counterfactual examples that will have the class changed and they'll be very close to the original test point. Counter, I mean, what kind of examples? Uh, um, so um, just the opposite class, a point very close to the test point, but with the opposite class. Um, maybe maybe we can talk about this. I think sure, I, sure. Maybe we can talk oh. about this later. Or you can type your question in the chat. Sure. Yeah, we, we can answer it anytime. So I think the main idea about this section just we can just uh, use some ideas from here to check whether our proposed defenses methods can really help our model to be safer. Maybe sometimes we just assume that, okay, now we, our text fails, maybe it can help, but actually it's not. We should be very careful when we evaluate the safety. Another, another thing to mention is that when we are considered this safety, we also assume the attacker can know the every, every step of how you do the differences. For example, they know how you do this transformation G and how you model is like. Okay. So if more questions, we'll go next. So after we see the stories about gradient masking and their corresponding defenses, now let us see another type of defenses called adversarial training. This type of adversarial defenses directly optimize the robustness measurements from an algorithmic perspective. So please remember the stories we are doing attacking. For example, we are given an input image X. We want to find a perturbation that can maximize this adversarial risk. So in order to mislead the model to make wrong predictions. 
So it means that this adversarial risk is higher. There is more probability that the model can be attacked. So now consider we are a defender. Can we just directly optimize the model to have averaged small adversarial risk over all the data distribution? So that is how the formulation of adversarial training comes. We just want to find a model parameter theta that can minimize the average adversarial risk of the model over the distribution. In 2018, a team from MIT just introduced a very effective and efficient algorithm to solve this optimization problem. So the idea is that in order to solve this mean max optimization problem, the first step is that for each training, for each training batch and for each training sample, it first finds such a delta star that can maximize this wealth value. So it means that we first attack this model to find the most dangerous adversarial example or the most adversarial example, which is this X plus delta star. And the second step is that we just update the model parameter theta in order to let the model have smallness on this calculated adversarial example, X plus delta theta. So by iteratively doing the step one and step two, the model can gradually be more robust and uh, it can even recognize the most dangerous adversarial examples around the input sample X. So here are just some experimental results on the adversarially trained models. For example, on the MNIST dataset. So on the MNIST dataset, the adversarial training can help the model to improve its robustness against PGD attack and a CW attack to more than 90% or even higher. And on the CIFAR-10 dataset, it also shows a very big improvement for the adversarial accuracy. But even until now, adversarial training is still one of the most effective or most reliable way that we can defend our model. And uh, there are many future works just to propose different ideas to improve the performance of adversarial training. Even though somehow adversarial training is shown to be the most effective way until now to improve model robustness. However, there are still some open topics about adversarial training which require a lot of efforts to solve. So among them, one of the hottest topics is about the trade-off relationship so between the model's clean accuracy and the adversarial accuracy. So these topics are based on the fact that if we can see this experimental results of PGD adversarial training, after we do the adversarial training, the model's accuracy on the clean examples can be somehow reduced by a large margin. So people call this phenomenon the trade-off relationship between clean and adversarial accuracy because they assume that if we want to have a more robust model, we have to sacrifice some clean accuracy. So here is just an example which tries to explain this trade-off phenomenon. So remember that when we are doing adversarial training, we want to minimize this average adversarial risk. Actually, we are doing this kind of thing that we try to minimize the probability of the case that for an input sample X, there is a delta around the X which can successfully attack this input sample. 
So if we take a closer look at this probability term in a toy example, for example, for the points which should be the red classes, this error probability means two parts. The first one is that it just falls in a wrong decision region, which means it is beyond the decision boundary, as the blue line shows here. And the second part is just that the sample locates in the right decision, decision region, but it is very close to the decision boundary. So there exists another reserve perturbation can make it go beyond the decision boundary. So now here is where the idea of this work comes in. It, it, it splits this error term into two probabilities. Here the first one means the new region in this example, which corrects from the standard error of the model. And the second term is this boundary error, which means the probability that an example is very close to the decision boundary, which means the purple part in this example. So if we take another look at the adversarial training objective, which equals to minimize the sum of these two probabilities. So now we can tell that the first term is just what is we are familiar with. When we are doing normal training, we want to minimize the standard error. So the second term here, just to take control of the model robustness, if we give more concentration on the second term, we want the model to be more robust. We want our examples to be farther than the decision boundary. So it also means that we take more sacrifice on the original natural error because we add more regularization to it. So by this way, maybe it can shed light on how we can understand this trade-off relationship between the clean accuracy and the adversarial accuracy. It is also worth to mention that their work introduced another way to do this robust optimization, which optimizes the two terms separately. From the experimental results of the traits shows that their proposed algorithm can even improve the adversarial robustness than the adversarial training. And they can also have more flexibility when to choose, for example, better clean accuracy or better adversarial accuracy. And here is another theoretical work which try to explain this trade-off relationship from a toy example. They just assume that in an image, the model can use two kinds of features for its prediction. The first kind of features is called the robust features. This type of features only have small dimensions, but they are strongly correlated with the images class. So this kind of features can really represent what does these images mean. And uh, there also exists another type of features called non-robust features. Even though these non-robust features have very high dimension in the input space, but they are only very weakly correlated with the images class. But however, because these features have high dimensional, so if we accumulated these features, they can also give us a 
they can also give us a very informative prediction for the model class. So the main theory of this work tells us that because adversarial training and natural training use different training strategies, and they will result that the robust model prefers to the robust model prefers to use robust features for prediction. And the non-robust features are only weakly correlated with the true label. So they can be easily perturbed. So only non-robust model will use these non-robust features. So the main idea is that the robust models use robust features for prediction. So it can only have a relatively good robustness, but cannot guarantee to have a good clean occurs. And the non-robust model will use well, but the non-robust model will only use the non-robust features. So even though it can have good clean accuracy, it cannot guarantee to have a good robustness. So that can also somehow explain why there exists a trade-off relationship. So until now, there are also many other works try to explain or mitigate these trade-off relationships. And uh, here is another very big topic about adversarial training, which called adversarial robustness generalization. So here is the story. When we are doing natural machine learning training, actually we don't suffer too much from overfitting. We can do some strat we can implement some strategies like very stopping to resolve the overfitting issues. But however, that is not the truth for the adversarially trained model. So here is an experimental result, which shows that when we are doing adversarial training on superintendent data set, after we training to some stage, the training robustness can improve to very high level. But that cannot give any benefit to the test robustness. So after the model training, so after the model is trained for and here for 40,000 steps, there is a huge gap between the training robustness and the test robustness. So that means that our good robustness on the training data set cannot well generalize to our test set. And the target and the targeted on this issue, there are also some theoretical works. For example, this one, try to prove that in order to resolve this generalization gap, we have to sample more data from our population. I think in this tutorial, I will be more concentrated on uh, talking about some alternative strategies which try to collect the data from outside resources efficiently the first work is called the Robust Self-Training Method. It shows us how we can efficiently collect more, data, more training data from outside resources. It shows us how we can efficiently enlarge our data sets from outside resources. So for example, now we want to train a very robust model on a CFR10 data set. Their proposed, their proposed idea is that they can use another data set from outside. This data set can have a much larger size than the or, original one. For example, this data set have 80 million images. However, the advantage of this work is that we do not require this data set can be labeled. So in order to take benefit from this unlabeled data set, the biggest difficulty is that because this data set has much more images than this one. So there are many images in this data set. It's not from any class in the CIPAR10 data set. So 
in order to solve this problem. The first, train a DNA model with 11 classes, which are from the 10 classes in the original dataset, and another additional class that, are, that consists of the images which does not belong to any classes in the Cpartan dataset. So by training such a model F1 with these 11 classes, they are able to give prediction for all of the images in this dataset. And then they can utilize this trained model to help to find the most confident images in this dataset and choose 50,000 from them and add it to our original dataset sequence. So by this way, we can have a labeled and a larger size sequence dataset. The next, the next step is just we use this enlarged dataset to do adversarial training. The experimental results show that the additional images does give a lot of benefits for the model's robustness and as well as the clean accuracy. And here is another work which smartly get the help from outside resources. In their proposed work, they take benefits from transfer learning. Their idea is that at the first step, they adversarially train a CAN model on a downsized image net dataset. And then they just use this transfer learning strategy, which fine tune on the CPAR 10 dataset. So by this process, maybe they can just get help from the information in the ImageNet dataset. And as a result, the transferred model does help the model robustness improved by more than 10%. Actually, there are more hot topics which are related to the adversarial training. I just go, I just quickly go through them. I just quickly go through them. So please remember that when we are doing adversarial training, so typically we just target uh, one specific type of attack. For example, we generate attacks from this IO infinity bounded perturbations. However, the experimental results show that we do the defenses for one type of attack. It is still vulnerable to other types of attacks, such as IL1 norm or IL0 norm bounded attacks. So, so therefore, how we can design an adversarial training strategy that can generalizable to different attacks is still a very hot topic. And the final one is about the scalability or the efficiency of the adversarial training. It is because even though we think PGD adversarial training is not because it requires to do the PGD attack iteratively. So, so in this process, it will require us to pay for several times of the computational cost. So if you are interested, you can also refer to these papers to see how they can improve this scalability issue of adversarial training. Is there any questions about 
this section. Actually, the adversarial training strategies are trying to solve the first goal that I just mentioned, trying to build a very, very powerful model that even can correctly classify the adversarial examples. And actually, this is still one of the most popular and the most effective methods when we are doing defenses. Okay, so if there is no more questions, we can take a short break at here and uh, we will come back at uh, after half of an hour.
Hi, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we we just uh, we just uh, talk about adversary training, which is a uh, one very effective methods to do defenses. So the the main idea is just that we keep generating adversary examples and uh, put them back to our training training pool, and uh, we train our model on those adversary examples. So by this way, our model can correctly classify even the adversary examples. And now we also talk about some recent very hot topics, which tries to improve the, the performance of adversary training. We talk about the adversary training might does harm to the model accuracy on the clean or benign images. Or we also talk about its robustness issue, uh, robust generalization issue. We also talk about how to train several robust models against, against different attacks and how to improve the scalability of the adversarial training on larger data set. If you have any question about adversarial training, just uh, feel free to, to, uh, to ask. And if, if, if there's no if there is no question about adversarial training, we will go to the next topic about doing how to about how to do defenses in a more formal or more exact way. And here is another type of defenses called certified defenses. It is a more serious way or more formal way to do the defenses or check the model's robustness. So please remember that we, so please remember that in the previous parts of our talk, we show some defenses can be attacked by more advanced attacks. And we also show adversarial training can effectively and reliably to improve the model robustness. So here is the question that there any chance in the future we can find more strong attacks to break the defenses which are successful until now. Which means that is one defended model guaranteed to be safe against any kind of adversarial examples. And that is how the story of certified defenses come. So from the start, please remember that when we are doing attacking, a traditional way is that we try to find a perturbation delta, which can maximize the loss value of the model on the input sample X. And then if we consider a RENU network with D layers, and the model output is here, the capital Z means the, means, means the output of the last layer before the softmax operation. So if you are familiar with the CW attack, we can also formulate our attacking goal as this way, that for any, that for any label T, which is not the correct label Y. We want to minimize this term, which means that we want the score of the last layer on the correct label to be as small as possible. And uh, the score on a wrong label can be as big as possible. And at the same time, it is constrained by our perturbation constraints. So for the certified defenses, they try to seriously or exactly solve 
this formula is the problem. So at this time, we cannot use the gradient based methods to do this attack because they are they can because they can only give us an approximate solution. And now there are some works that use the combinatorial solutions trying to solve this problem. They are based on applying SMT solver or the integer programming solver. We don't, we don't, in this, in, in our talk, we don't talk too much about the exact solution from these two, two. In our talk, we don't talk about too much details about these solutions. But the advantage of these works just show that if we can find this exact value of P, if this P is larger than zero, means we cannot, means that we cannot attack the model F on the sample X by any other theory example. The score on the correct label is always larger than the score from other labels. And if this P is smaller than zero, which means we can successfully find an adversary example, which can let the model give a larger score to a wrong prediction label. So this story means that if we can successfully solve this problem, we can know for sure whether a model can be attacked or not on the input sample X. I just mentioned that we use this SMT solver or the integer programming solver to solve for each test sample from the distribution. However, so so you so in either method it will take a lot of computational cost and make it even impossible for real world applications. So is there any strategy that we can compromise this strict, strictness for somehow? So here is the work of the convex relaxation. So, so now if we can have a, so now if we take a closer look at the optimization problem we're trying to solve. We try to maximize this loss value, which subjects to the values of each layer satisfy those constraints. So at here we can see that both the objective or the constraints, most of them are linear and convex. The, the only violation is from this renew activation function. For example, for one single neuron from the neural network, we can see that the input of the RAMU and the output of the RAMU, they have a nonlinear relationship in the data space. So here comes to the idea of the convex relaxation. They just relax this nonlinear relationship into three convex and linear bounds. So from this example, we can see that for all the, point, for all the points in the original bounded region, all of them are covered by the new bounds, which can be described from these three inequalities. So by this way, they can successfully transfer this nonlinear relationship into a convex and a linear constraints. So if we just replace those value activations with this alternative bounds in our optimization problem, we can transfer the original problem into a linear programming into a linear programming problem 
which we can use our existing tools to solve. And in this relaxation process, we can see that we just enlarge the searching, the searching, the searching region of this optimization problem. So our finally optimized value Q should be smaller than the original solution P. Than the, than the original solution P. So now if we can successfully calculate this Q value during the inference time, if this Q is larger than zero, which means P is also larger than zero, which means that the model cannot be attacked at X. However, if this Q is not larger than zero, this, this doesn't mean that P is also smaller than zero and that we cannot make sure whether it can be attacked or not. In the real application, this certification methods can tell us at least how many samples are safe and cannot be attacked by any other serial examples. And in addition to that, they also can use this certified bond to do the robust optimization. The idea is similar to adversarial training. They, they just, uh, they just uh, optimize the model parameter theta to minimize the loss value on the found optimal perturbation delta. So the, and the experimental results show that on um, MNIST dataset, by doing their robust optimization algorithm, they can show, they can prove that, they can probably show that at least 94% of all the test samples cannot be attacked by any perturbation which are constrained by our infinity room smaller than 0 0.1. And the another type of Provable defenses is called a semi-definite relax. It's called a semi-definite programming relaxation method. In this tutorial, we don't go to too much details about this one. In 2019, there is another state-of-the-art certified defense method called a randomized smoothing. The idea is that in order to do the certification, it first sample uh, many random noise from this Gaussian distribution and you added them to the and added them to your image. So in this process, you can count the number of your prediction results for each class. For example, we sample for 10,000 samples from this Gaussian distribution. And for example, among them, the model predicts the perturbed image as the first class for 2,000 times. And this estimated prob probability should be 0 0.2. And we can just choose the class which the model give the most prediction outcomes. So we can so we can also see this process. So we can also see this process as a classifier, which we call at here the smallest smoothest version, the smoothest version of the original classifier. The, in this paper the in this paper, the authors suggest that the advantage that we use this smooth version of F because it is because it has much more good statistical properties. For example, it has more, for example, it has smoother 
decision boundary. And it also has many good mathematical properties that we can do the mathematical improvement. For example, if we just use the sampling process, for example, if we just follow the sampling process, we can get two most probable classes. And this and this work just use a mathematical proof to show that there is no adversary example in the neighbor of the original image with the radius constrained by this R, which is in term of the or which is in terms of the lower bound of this estimated probability of the most probable chaos and the second most probable chaos. Because we can use statistical methods to estimate these two terms and we are able to calculate this R and we can tell for this model in what region it, it is proved or it is guaranteed to have no adversary example in its neighbor. And that is how the certified, and that is how the randomized smoothing certified defense works. So as, so as a basic summary, so as a brief summarization here, in the defense section, we talk about some heuristic defenses which try to set barriers for attackers. And then we also talk about how adaptive attacks tries to block those defenses. And then we also talked about a very effective training strat defense strategy called adversarial training. And then we talk about their weakness and some open topics about it. And then finally, we talk about to certify defense algorithms, which try to be the most serious way to evaluate our model robustness. I, uh, so the basic reason why they do this certified defense is, is because, because we know that the, some gradient obfuscation methods have already broken by new defenses. And uh, now some people say that adversary training is very, is very safe and uh, currently attacking algorithms cannot, attacking, cannot attack it. But we don't know yet whether we can just introduce new, more advanced attacks to, to break those, even the currently successful defenses. So that's why they just are trying to, to evaluate the model safety very seriously. They try to, they try to solve these problem, they try to solve these problems on theory that they use very strict methods to calculate the adversary examples and the adversarial risks. And uh, if you really want to achieve this goal, you have to pay much effort. For example, you have to you have to do the uh, you have to do the linear programming, such as this pay for a lot of computer, computational costs or do some, do some theoretical improvement. So by this way, you can really know for sure whether your model is safe or not. Okay, if so, if so, there's no more questions about the defenses methods.
you can just uh, introduce some stories about the adversarial learning in the graph domain. Hello everyone, I'm Wei Jing and I'm the PhD student from Michigan State University. Han has just introduced the attack and defense algorithms that are focused on image domain. Now I'm going to talk about the attacks and the robustness of in graph domain, especially the robustness of graph networks. Now let's get started. Graphs are ubiquitous data structures in numerous domains, for example, in social media, we have social graphs where each person is represented as a node and the relation between persons is represented as an edge. In traffic management, we have transportation graphs and we also have brain graphs, web graphs, molecular graphs, and gene graphs. To effectively extract meaningful information from such graph data, graph neural networks are developed. They are actually the extension of deep neural networks to graph structure data. As we can see from the figure, a graph neural network takes the graph as an input data. Then it applies several convolutional layers and nonlinear activation layers. Then it obtains the node level or graph level representations. The representations are then utilized to solve downstream tasks such as node classification and graph classification. In this talk, we will focus on node level applications. As Han introduced before, convolutional neural networks are vulnerable to adversarial attacks. Then the question comes, since graph neural network is an extension of convolutional neural network, does it face the same problem? So say if we if we add some adversarial noise into the graph with the prediction of the gene and change. Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Now let's take a look at an example. Here we have a graph which contains six blue nodes and two green nodes. Here the goal of gene is to predict the color of the nodes. And you can say the, GC, the GNN successfully predicts node 8 as a green node, but then we add some adversarial noise to the graph. Uh, that is, we connect the green node 8 with the blue 3. It is, small, it is a very small change on the graph, but we find that the GNN will give the wrong prediction and predict node 8 as a blue node. So in this case, the graph neural network is fooled by the adversarial attack. Then you may ask, why is this problem important? Uh, yeah, actually we don't care about this toy example, but if the graph is a credit card transition graph and the two green nodes are actually two floristers, the florister can connect with some other high credit users to, to discuss itself and then escape from the detection of the GN model. And this can be very detrimental. So except, from, except for financial systems, graph adversarial attacks can also harm the recommender systems, like social recommendation in Facebook and the product recommendation in Amazon, where the attacker can change the ranking of the recommended items. In the rest of the presentation, I will divide the speech into two parts. The popular attacking methods and how do we defend against adversarial attacks. For the attacking methods, there are already a lot of work studying adversarial attacks on image data. Can we just directly apply the existing solutions to generate graph attacks? Unfortunately, we cannot. There are several main differences between graph data and image data. The first one is discreteness. As shown in the red figure, we know the pixel values in image data are continuous. But for graphs, we, we only use adjusted matrix to represent the graph structure, where zero means there's no edge between, node, between nodes, and one means there exists an edge. 
So we can say the GSS matrix is discrete, it is binary. The second main difference is that the perturbation, the perturbation measure is quite different. Since adversarial attacks should be unnoticeable, when we are generating adversarial attacks, we need to tell whether the adversarial perturbation is small or not. For image data, we human can easily tell whether two images are similar. But for graphs, if we change the structure, it's very hard for human to say whether the changed graph are similar or not. So that's the second difference. And for the third difference, it is about the perturbation type. In graphs, there are much more perturbation types than images. So next up, I want to talk about more about the perturbation types in graphs. The first one would be adding an edge in the graph. So we can we can easily add an edge between two nodes, and also we can delete an edge between two nodes. The third one is rewiring, where we can first delete an edge between the two nodes, and then connect one of the nodes with the third one. This is called rewiring. And another interesting perturbation type is node injection, where we add a fake node and where we create a fake node and then connect the fake, fake node with other nodes. This is just like in Facebook, uh, we can create some new accounts and then use this new account to um, to connect with other users, and then we can inject some adversarial noise. Except for changing graph structure, we can also modify features. So here we can modify the features of node 8. So uh, that is all about the perturbation type. And we can also have some other categorizations for the graph attacks. Uh, here we can also divide the graph attack into poisoning and evasion attack. Uh, for evasion attack, we are actually uh, injecting the adversarial attack in the testing stage. So that means the attack happens after the GM model is trained. And for the poisoning attack, it happens at the training stage where the model is trained based on the attacked graph. So this is called poisoning attack. We can also divide the attacks into targeted and non For targeted attack, the attacker it aims to degrade the performance of uh, some specific target nodes. Like in the left figure, the target node is uh, node 8. But for long target attack, the goal of the attacker is to degrade the overall performance of GNN on the whole node data set. So that is uh, much more detrimental to the whole system. Since we have covered the categories of different attacks, we list some representative algorithms and categorize them into this table. Due to the time constraint, we only choose three of them to elaborate. Uh, let's first take a look at the algorithm GradAgMax. The goal of GradAgMax is to find the perturbed graph A height and X height, which maximize the loss between output and label Y. Know that theta star is the, the optimized parameter of gene and train on graph A prime and X, X prime. A, A prime and X prime can either be the original graph or perturbed graph. To make sure the perturbation is unnoticeable, we constrain the number of changed edges and features to be smaller than beta. Based on the formulation we just introduced, if we want to do structure modification, we can just change A. If we want to do a feature modification, we can just change X. If we want to perform evasion attack, a prime and X prime should be the original adjacent matrix and the feature matrix to make sure that the genes is trained on the unattacked graph. But for a poisoning attack, A prime and X prime should be the attacked graph. 
to make sure the gene is trained on the attacked graph. For non-targeted attack, the target neuroset VT is actually the whole neuroset VO. While for targeted attack, VT is only a small subset of the whole neuroset. To optimize the maximization problem, a straightforward idea is to employ gradient ascent. However, due to the discreteness of graph data, it is not directly applicable. So, Gradac Max uses a gradient way where in each step it chooses the perturbation with the maximum gradient. And by repeat this process, uh, we can finally get the perturbed graph. Next, I want to talk about the second algorithm, net tag. The aforementioned gradient max algorithm has some shortcomings. First, it needs to calculate the gradient from the model. So it needs to access the model parameters, which is not very practical in the real world setting. The second shortcoming is the provision constraint is not enough. This, since it only put constraints on the, on the number of changed edges and features. So to solve these two problems, NetHack first proposed to train a circuit model. So in this way, it can directly use the information from the circuit model without accessing the target victim model. And to address the second shortcoming, in addition to constraint on the number of changed edges and features, we can add two more constraints. The first is to preserve the degree distribution of the original graph. The second one is to preserve facial concurrence Preserving facial concurrency is very important since uh, when we modify node features, if we if if two features have never occurred together in the original graph, but they are suddenly used, they are suddenly both used in the modified graph, such change is easily detected. So we want to preserve facial concurrence to make the perturbation more unnoticeable. Uh, next, let's take a look at how that attack generates the uh, attacks. From all the possible perturbations, we can generate candidates that will not violate the discrete degree distribution and feature concurrence. And then we choose the perturbation that maximize the score. Here the score is the classification margin between other classes and the true label. If the score is large, it means the probability of the Node being this large. Then we modify the graph according to the perturbation by repeating this process until we reach the perturbation constraint. We can get the final finally perturbed graph, which can fool the target gene model into giving wrong predictions. So that is for net tag. Next, I want to talk about the third algorithm, reward. Reward is our work in 2019. The motivation behind it is the degree distribution may not be an ideal measure for perturbations. So the question is how to make perturbation more unnoticeable. And our answer is rewiring. Remember that a single rewiring operation involves three nodes, V1, V2, and V3 where we remove the existing edge between V1 and V2 and add an edge between V1 and V3. Note that in reward, we constrain V3 to be the second half neighbor of V1 in our say. There are some important advantages of rewiring. First, the number of nodes and edges remain the same after rewiring. Second, it improves to affect algebraic connectivity and effective graph resistance in a much smaller way. Both of the two metrics are important measure for graph robustness. Uh, having known that, we can, we can apply rearing as the single operation during attack. Then the question is how to repeatedly, repeatedly generate the attacks step by step. 
Reward employs reinforcement learning to guide the generation of attacks. It first uses GCN to get node and edge embeddings, and through a Python network, it will output the nodes to be rewired. Based on the perturbed graph, the reinforcement learning agent will receive a reward. By optimizing the reward, it can generate the final perturbed graph. So that is the details of reward. Since we have covered some important attack algorithms, next I want to talk about how to defend against those adversarial attacks. Basically, there are three different ways to do so. The first is adversarial training, the second is graph purifying, and the final is attention mechanism. Let's first talk about adversarial training. The motivation of adversarial training is to augment the training set with the adversarial data. So the main idea of it is to first find the perturbation delta A and delta X that can maximize the GNN loss. And then GNN is trained on the changed graph to minimize the training loss. By iteratively doing so, we can obtain a robust G graph network model. However, there are still some obstacles. The graph adjacency matrix is discrete and often the feature matrix is also discrete. So directly applying gradient ascent to or descent to optimize this problem is not directly applicable. So one solution to do is to use hidden adversarial training. Specifically, we can apply adversarial training on the hidden layer. Since the hidden representations are continuous, we won't have the discrete issue anymore. The second defense type is graph purifying, where we aim to purify the attacked graph. One graph purifying strategy is to do pre-processing. The main idea of it is to purify the point in the graph and train the GNN on the purified graph, as shown in this figure. Researchers have two observations about adversarial attacks. First, attackers favor adding edges than removing edges. Second, if we plot the frequency of edges with respect to the jacquard similarity between the connected nodes, we will find that in clean graph, most of the connected nodes have similarity close to 0.1. While in the attacked graph, most of the nodes only have similarity of 0.01, which means attackers tend to connect these similar nodes. However, pre-processing may not be an ideal choice for purifying the graph. It can mistakenly remove normal edges. So another purifying strategy is graph learning. Our work at KDD 2020 Pro GNN is an example. We propose to jointly optimize the graph structure and genome parameters. After that, we can obtain both clean graph structure and the trained gene parameters. Then the question is, how do we guide the graph learning process? There are actually many important graph properties we can tend to. Here we study three main properties. They are low rank, sparsely, feature smoothness. We find that adversarial attacks can essentially vary those properties. First, it can increase the rank of the adjacent matrix, which is shown in the figure. We find that on all of the three data sets, adversarial attack can essentially increase the rank of the adjacent matrix. Second, if you remember, adversarial attack will also increase the number of long zero entries in the adjacent matrix, which result in the increase of sparsity. Third, adversarial attack tends to increase the feature difference between the connected nodes thus breaking the feature smoothness of the original graph. Having known that the adversarial attacks can actually break those properties, we can design our framework ProGN now. By preserving the three properties, we propose ProGN to jointly learn the clean graph structure and GM parameters. At each training epoch, we first update graph structure to make it more clean and use the updated graph to learn GM parameters. By iteratively training the 
the, these two process, we can finally know both the clean graph structure and gene parameters. So that are the details of the graph purifying. Next, we will introduce defending against adversarial attack by using attention mechanism. The main idea of using attention mechanism is to reduce the impact of adversarial edges or nodes. By giving more attention scores to the adversarial edges or nodes, it will contribute much less to the final node representations. Therefore, the adversarial attack will not have much effect on the model anymore. An example of using attention mechanism is RGCN. Since the attacked nodes may connect with different communities, they may have higher uncertainty than the, than the normal nodes. So we should give them no attention scores to reduce their impact. Then the question is, how do we model the uncertainty of nodes? As we said before, since we have modeled the node hidden representations as Gaussian distribution, the uncertainty can be captured by the variance of the distribution. Then we can employ attention mechanism to penalize those nodes with high variance and try to reduce their impact. Here node alpha j is the attention score assigned to node j. As we can see here, if the variance sigma is large, the attention score would be very small, thus achieving the goal of penalizing high variance nodes. In experience, it has been demonstrated that the attacking nodes do have high, higher variance, which is in line with the original motivation of RGCN, which is shown in the right hand figure. Now let's take a look at another example of using attention mechanism, PAGN. The motivation behind it is only relying on the particular graph to learn attention coefficients not enough to obtain high robustness. We should exploit information from clean graphs. And importantly, there do exist a lot of clean graphs that are from the similar domain. So for example, Facebook and Twitter are both network data. They are, uh, they are, both, so they are both social network data, so they are from the similar domain. The second example is Yelp and the Foursquare. They are both review review website and the data from it can also be formed as graphs from similar domain. So if we can obtain these graphs from similar domain, we can turn to transfer learning or meta learning to leverage such information. Now let's look at the framework of PAGN. First, we are faced with the point graph B. And then we try to find some clean graphs G1, G2, Gn from a similar domain and perturb those graphs by ourselves. Since we are the one who perturb the graphs, we know which edges are adversarial, which are not, which are not. Such information can be used to guide the training of graph attention model, which will penalize those adversarial edges or nodes. Further, since the current model is trained only on the clean graphs, we need to transfer those, this information to the current point in graph G. So then we can employ the techniques in meta learning or transfer learning and transfer those knowledge to the current point in the graph. And finally, we will get a robust GNN model. So that is the overall framework of PAGN. So here we have covered the part of robustness of graph neural networks. Next, I will pass the beta to Yanxin, who is going to introduce our adversarial repository, Deep Robust. So let's welcome her. So if you have any questions about the graph attacks and the defenses, you can just shoot and we will help to answer.
I think, I think the adversarial attacks and the defenses for graph data may just tell us that for different kinds of data, we should have different perspectives and uh, different to, uh, approaches to check their safety issues. For example, the graph is different from image because sometimes, always it is discrete and uh, it is not independent. It's, it, it, each, each sample is not independent with each other. And it, it also has a different training process. So during, so during studying the safety of the graph structure data models, we have to take, we have to use different strategies. The, So if there is no more questions about the adversarial attacks and the defenses about the graph structure data, in the next V and also the last part of our tutorial, we are very pleased to introduce a very easy to use Python repository, which is built by our group, which try to help our, for example, the practitioners for adversarial learning to do the to do the practice about adversarial uh, attacks and defenses. We have already shared the GitHub link to the chat box. If you are interested, if you are interested, you can just refer to the link. And the next, Yaxin will show that how, Yaxin will give a, a very short demo to show that how we can use this repository to do the a practice on the Python repository. Now we come to the DeepRobust. DeepRobust is a PyTorch adversarial learning library which contains the aforementioned algorithms. It contains two sub-packages, image one and the graph one. Image package contains 10 attack methods and 7 defense methods. And 9 of the attack algorithms are white box attack, and one of them is black box attack. The graph package contains 10, image, uh, 10 attack algorithms and 6 defense algorithms. Among those attacks, 5 of them are target attack, and 5 of them are global attack. In other words, attack. So let's take a detailed look at the image package. It contains attack sub-package, defense package, and model package. All the algorithms are listed here. And each algorithm is a class derived from the attack-based class or defense-based class, which bring convenience to further extension of this package. And now it includes the model architectures listed here, and you can add any model file as you wish. And we also include a config file, which contains some precise parameters and evaluation program, which could evaluate certain attack for certain defense automatically. And the graph package contains data package, which helps you download data set and also contain other commonly used functions. The other three packages are global attack, target attack, and defenses. Next, we are going to have a high down instruction for adversary training process for image. First, generate adversary example. After import package you need and load model, you can simply generate an object of PGD class and pass the weekend model to it. Then you can call generate function to generate adversary examples after you feed enough parameters. Or you can just use the configure setting config file to have a try as shown here. Details of configs can be found in our documentation. And here, the readout you can see. The last, last one is adversary examples generated by PGD algorithms 
under different preservation budgets on C410 data set. And the right one is adversarial examples under different preservation constraint for at least data sets. You can see this. In our human eyes, we can still distinguish them, but they will totally be misclassified by the predictor. Then we introduced the adversarial training. The process is pretty much the same. Upload the model and data, then generate an objection of PGD training class and pass the initialized model and call generate function to get a robust model. Note that most of the class is based on attack or defense based class. Take adversarial training as an example. We provide basic component for a whole adversarial training. Try your own algorithm, simply override some of them. And here we show some results we generate. The last one is a heat map that shows the performance of different image attack methods toward different image defense models. And the right one is a performance of one graph attack on different data sets. So you can start to do experiments to evaluate your defense methods very fast. The link of data robust is provided here. And we also have the documentation. Use your phone to scan the code and you would get the access. Get more detailed information from the documentation and readme file. This is the end of our tutorial. We are very glad to have this chance to talk to you. And thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay, thank you everyone. If you have any question, you can just uh, shoot that here or not, or you can, you are also welcome to contact us in person in, after the finish of this tutorial. Okay, thanks again for listening to this tutorial.
Uh, I will answer some questions about the chat box. The, the recorded video is available on YouTube. You can use this link from our website to check where you can find the recorded video session. And uh, John, if you, you can also chat with Wei by voice if you, if, if you can state your a question, if he can answer your question more clearly. Uh, 